Well, we're going to go ahead and get started here today. I know some people are still logging on, but we'll have, have a few comments before we kind of jump into it. But the today today's session is on the Consolidated Appropriations Act, and really effectively, it's it's the continuation of PPP, the CARES Act, and uh, the Consolidated Appropriations Act that was was passed in in late December. If we look back over the last year, I'm not sure we all would have chosen the 2020 2020 year that we had. And yet as a firm, we're happy that we've been able to support our clients through this process. Uh, we, we've developed a, a new skill set of knowledge related to SBA and the CARES Act. And we've been able to support you know, many, many clients uh, through this process. And, and we are thankful for that. Um, a, as we kind of move on here and we look at kind of what we're covering today, we are, it's really, we're, we're hitting the highlights. Um, we're hitting the highlights of the act. We're hitting the things that we believe are the most relevant to uh, each of us. And this has kind of been culled through a series of, of comments and questions we've received from clients uh, over the last several weeks. And so what we've nailed down is really the key points. And so at the end of this, you're gonna see an appendices. Uh, once, once this is emailed out, that appendices is gonna have 30 to 40 additional slides that we believe are relevant but weren't necessarily wasn't necessarily the best use of our time during this during this during this session. So we're going to cover the key points that we think are most important, and there's going to be additional information once you receive the deck. From a list of presenters today that we have, um, we really this core team here that we have, um, Jason Sharp, tax partner. He he's really been involved in kind of the forefront of understanding the legislation, applying it to our clients, and getting that information out. Rick Westerfeld, he, he's got the job here today of, of, of answering questions that are coming in through the chat, and he'll do a very good job of that. And myself, uh, I'm an advisory principal, Kevin Stewart. Um, I lead the, uh, with, within the advisory practice, I lead the client advisory services group, client accounting services, where we service kind of the outsource function for clients. We've also been leading this effort uh, with John and Kelly on the uh, PPP uh, work for clients. Uh, I think we've advised hundreds of clients at this point. We've assisted 75 plus through the forgiveness process successfully. And kind of leading to that, John and Kelly is a manager on the advisory team, really is the key expert on PPP. And many of you probably have visited with her because it seems like she's consulted across the board with many clients. Krista Joganath, audit principal. She kind of represents our audit side, uh, specifically audit, or excuse me, specifically Krista is the leader of our hospitality, specifically even more so than that, the, the restaurant and hospitality practice. She's got some insights on the audit reporting as well as on the uh, restaurant side. And then Eric Deal, Associate Director within BNB Capital Advisors. He's really become an expert on kind of the SBA fundings and, and needs for clients and, and even more so on those, on those issues that relate to acquisitions or potential acquisitions. So on the topics that we're specifically covering today, or at least the highlights of the topics we're covering today, learning objectives, it's learning about the extensions on tax credits and employee retention credits. And we've really had to narrow this down to allow from, for, for allow for the talking points on these specific things. Uh, and then I know a highlight of this is on that PPP loan forgiveness. You know, does it make sense to go for a PPP too? Or maybe you didn't get funding in the first one and you need to go back. What are the, what are the requirements? And then towards the end of this, we're really kind of getting in and understanding our eligibility for PPP2. And then separately, um, uh, the other opportunities for forgiveness requirements, you know, uh, and then potential acquisitions, idle advances, and other things related to other things beyond PPP. So when we look at, you know, this has really been an ever evolving process as to kind of get through this. You know, from the very beginning, um, we've, we've got multiple involvements from different agencies, IRS, SBA, you know, Department of Treasury, Department of Labor. It seems like as new legislation rolls out, then there's a one to two week delay on new information. And then based on that new information, there's more questions. And then one to two weeks later, there's more information coming out. So really we've dug in from the very beginning. We've plugged into, been plugged in with the AICPA. We've done our own research. We've, we've done a lot of reading our, our SBA process team including the folks on this call, or on, uh, on the present presenters on this call and beyond that, really attempted to dive in, dive in, understand the questions that our clients have, understand the questions that we have, and being able to relay that, relay that back to you through webcasts, through articles, through emails, and through lots and lots of conversations, and we're happy to do that. And so moving on here, we, we look at 
we look at Washington's response, if we go back all the way, it seems it's been 10 months at this point. So March 18th, uh, the, the FFCRA Act was passed, which allowed for uh, financial relief for businesses for time off for employees. Really, what was the impact of COVID? And the next was the CARES Act, which we've, we've hit in depth over the last year um, and more so. And it, it seems like that, that has continued to change and continue to evolve. And if we look at that sole purpose, that really was to house the best, best way to get funds to people who need it. And that was through payroll. And so they created this loan, loan portfolio, loan, loan methodology by which getting money to the, to the people in need. And then we get to the PPP Flexibility Act, which allowed some extended, extended time frame by which to use. So initially, eight weeks was kind of that time frame, and that has evolved to 24. That conceptually, that probably makes sense because eight weeks really isn't enough to do much of anything. 24 weeks is a little bit more of allowance. And then we fast forward to December 27th, which seems like a lifetime ago at this point, based on all that's happened in the last two to three weeks, there was, there was the passing of the Consolidations Act, which really we're covering that fairly in depth now. But through all this and through this knowledge that we've, we've gained and trying to assist clients, really we've, we've prided ourselves in being able to assist, right? You know, again, we weren't really looking to the 2020 that we had, and yet it, it has allowed us to serve in a different way and not just our clients, but the community. And that's kind of the extension of what we're doing here. And so with that, I'd like to lead into our kind of our first presenter who's Jason, well, my bad, I'm wrong here. So some of the highlights of the act that we've kind of gotten to here is you know it six hundred dollars stimulus payments you know it was twelve hundred dollars early in the first one six hundred dollars in this one mill reduction mill deduction I'm not sure the impact of that necessarily but it's there so take out your clients you know we can we can take you out as well lending programs a simplified forgiveness which that is that is a large that is a kind of a big thing here as far as the simplified simplified forgiveness for loans under a certain dollar amount and we kind of go through the kind of the remaining of these things but um, Deductibility of PPP expenses was, was a big one at the end of the year that everyone was pushing for and looking towards. And even congressmen who passed it initially saying it was the intent that those expenses would have been deductible for tax purposes to begin with. So that was kind of a nice add in. And then employer credits as well here. So with that, I think we got a poll question up here, but we transition into Jason Sharp, who will be kind of leading us through kind of the tax piece of this uh, presentation. All right, thanks, Kevin, appreciate it. So, you know, again, this has uh, been a unique year. Typically, when we have tax legislation, you know, you sort of have time to absorb it and, and move on. And here, uh, we sort of have this layering, if you will, of several different pieces of legislation that came in during 2020. Um, and, and, and there's a sort of an overlap uh, intertwining of it. So, you know, we're trying to just sort of talk about the um, the new law that came in the CAA uh, that, that was just passed here at the end of December, but we did want to sort of touch on a little bit of the other legislation that had happened during the year, uh, because it, you, you kind of need that for a backdrop, because um, a lot of this legislation, again, is going back and adjusting uh, previous COVID-related uh, legislation. So, so with that, just sort of touching on the, the first thing that we got back in March uh, was the FFCRA, which, um, to refresh your memory, this was set up, basically, the, the idea was uh, there are many companies that maybe don't have um, sort of robust leave policies. A lot of workers may be hourly. If they're not working, then they're not getting paid. They can't really leave. They, they knew there was going to be this need for um folks to potentially stay at home because they have COVID or, or care for family members, children, that sort of thing. So um, the best thing they wanted to do was incentivize employers to allow the employees to have this leave. So that's what the FFCRA was designed to do. So it provides uh, family medical leave, sick leave, and, and it's paid for with tax credits. So, um, so what happens is if, if a company is participating with it, um, then potentially they can um, get payroll tax credits um, to help fund this uh, for, for something they may not have originally had. Um, so the FFCRA began in April of last year and officially it ended in uh, December 31st of 2020. However, employers are allowed to, um, to voluntarily extend it through March 31st of 21. Um, so, 
you know, as, as we said, we're going to send out the slide deck, and, and there's a couple of good links here. Uh, the, the first one is um, the first Q&A they issued on the FFCRA, so it has a lot of the basic information on how everything was supposed to work sort of for last year. Um, but then that, that second link uh, is also from the DOL. Again, this is all done through the Department of Labor. It's paid for with a payroll tax, but it's really all under the Department of Labor. So uh, the DOL issued that, that second item there um, just in late December after, after this law came into uh, to being. And it has some information on, on how it is supposed to be handled in 21. So highly recommend um, uh, if you want to learn more, th th those two links are good starting points. Um, and sort of talking about links in general, I do want to sort of, I, I will uh, give a shout out, probably a rare shout out to our friends in the government. Um, I think as a tax practitioner, we're often very frustrated with the, the lack of uh, in, information, certainly the speed at which information is sometimes uh, put out or just a total lack of it. I think the IRS um, and the SBA and um, you know, DOL and all of these government groups that have been working through here have done a really good job at, at putting out these FAQs, uh, different Q and A's or, you know, whatever format they want to have. They update them almost probably on a weekly or biweekly basis and will add questions and answers. They are an excellent resource. Um, again, I will uh, give kudos to, to those folks because they've done a, a really good job uh, trying to get information out as fast as possible. Uh, the problem, uh, you may not be aware, but whenever they write law like this, um, you know, from a tax perspective, for example, the IRS can write regulations about law, but regulations are you know, sort of the stupid cousin to law. It's just one notch below it. And so there's a lot of protocols and um, hierarchy to issuing regulations and it would take months if not a year or two to issue regulations. So that's why they're doing these FAQs, these like Q&A web pages. They can get the information out really fast. They can sort of go around all of the requirements of issuing official regulations and try and get answers to folks fast. So, okay, so we touched on the FFCRA. So now we have the CARES Act. So uh, the CARES Act again was uh, also came in in March um, and, and this is just kind of a highlight. Most of these items you guys are probably already familiar with. Uh, you know, we had the rebates. Um, you could make, there was some uh, loosening of the rules around retirement plan distributions and retirement loans. Um, and they uh, actually loosened some of the uh, uh, charitable contributions to try and encourage folks to be charitable, even in, uh, in, in light of the pandemic. Um, they offered the employer retention credit, and I highlighted here because this one did change pretty significantly with the CAA. Um, we had a delay of employer payroll tax, the employer portion of the payroll taxes. Um, they allowed folks to have NOL carrybacks. Uh, the, the rationale there is they knew cash is king, so they want to get cash in people's pockets. And so one way to do that would be um, to... Uh, the TCJA at the end of 2017 took away the ability to carry back NOLs. So uh, this for 18, 19 and 20 allows you to go back and get them. Uh, they they uh, took away some of the uh, limitations on interest expense. Uh, again, trying to give folks more deductions to decrease their taxes. And, and they allowed for uh, the, the QIP. Um, that was actually just an error in the TCJA. And uh, they basically fixed it with the uh, with the CARES Act. So again, um, a lot of information about the CARES Act, as, as Kevin pointed out at the beginning, we have an appendix. So a lot of our information on the CARES Act, we sort of dropped to the appendix. And the reason there was, you guys are probably already kind of familiar with it and we wanted to focus on the new law, but to the extent you maybe have some questions or wanna understand it, uh, we, we're gonna provide you with at least a little more information. So the big, the biggest ticket item, I probably should have saved this for my big finish at the end. You know, I'm kind of starting out now. Everything's going to be downhill from here. But um, this was probably maybe the biggest item out of um, the CAA. So um, to, to sort of set everyone's uh, or, or to refresh everyone's memory on this, the CARES Act, when it came out, had a uh, portion in the statute that made it abundantly clear that any amount forgiven was not to be taxable. And this is because 
uh, in the in, in the regular sort of our you know our current tax code, oftentimes if a taxpayer is forgiven a debt, uh, they potentially could have an income pickup uh, known as cancellation of debt income. And uh, there's some exceptions to that around bankruptcy and things like that. But but generally, if you're relieved of a debt, you potentially could have an income uh, I, uh, income pickup item. So they they wanted to make it very clear with the CARES Act that. Um, any forgiveness of debt of a PPP loan would not be considered taxable income. Well, not long after that, um, our friends at Treasury did not like that answer, maybe indirectly. So what they did was they issued an IRS notice, I believe it was either the end of April or early May, uh, that basically said, if you um, pay expenses with PPP money that is ultimately forgiven, then you're not allowed to deduct those expenses. And, and this caused a huge uproar among taxpayers, among a lot of uh, actually folks on Capitol Hill who had brought the CARES Act to life um, and said, this is completely counter to our intention of the CARES Act. And the treasury argument was, this is a double dip. We're handing you free money and not giving you income. And now you're gonna get deductions from it on top of it. Um, they kind of uh, based this on some really, lesser known tax exempt uh, income cases from decades ago. Um, a, a lot of really smart people thought the IRS argument wasn't even really a sound argument. And if you were to ever take them to tax court, you would prevail. But of course, who wants to try and fight the IRS in tax court? And so this caused a lot of problems and Congress said they were gonna fix it. And so uh, I guess they were good to their word. Um, the CAA, um, actually makes it abundantly clear that not only is any forgiveness of debt of PPP loans is not income, any expenses that would normally be deductible uh, by a taxpayer or a borrower uh, are still deductible. So this is huge news uh, for, for all of our PPP borrowers. Um, it's very taxpayer friendly, um, very beneficial, obviously. I mean, if you're talking about someone who got a you know, million dollar or, you know, say a million dollar PPP loan, um, they were going to not get deductions for that. I mean, that's potentially, you know, three or $400,000 in additional tax. So this saves all of that. Um, so that was, that's a huge one. That, that one's uh, really probably the, the, the biggest thing out of the CAA. The next thing that I think um, was also really big um, from the CAA, man, I, I, I got to do a better job. You got to save the big stuff for the end. Make sure you guys are listening. But anyway, um, I, uh, it's the employee retention credit. So um, this slide here sort of describes what the original um, ERC was supposed to do. And th the biggest thing about this was um, if you, th this was mutually exclusive with PPP loans. So if, if you borrowed money with a PPP loan, you couldn't take the ERC um, or vice versa. If you took an ERC, then you were ineligible to get a PPP loan. So uh, the way this worked was if your business was negatively impacted, you had a uh, decline in gross receipts or a governmental order basically shut your business down, um, then you were perhaps eligible to claim the employee retention credit. Um, and what that would allow you to do is a, again, it's, it's done through payroll tax credits, similar to the FFCRA. You could get up to 50% of the qualified wages paid up to $10,000 of wages per employee. So this was for March, 2020 um, through December 31st of 2020. So what was interesting with um, the CAA, um, next slide, please. The, um, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. This is just a little more information about, no, 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 you're good. Uh, this is just a little more information about the employee retention credit, who sort of qualifies. Again, a couple of really good links in here um, from the IRS, just generally talking about uh, the ERC and then also an FAQ uh, that has probably 85% of the questions people are gonna ask are gonna be answered on that page. So, so now moving on to the CAA, it's made some huge changes to this. And again, these are all uh, sort of taxpayer friendly uh, and PPP borrower friendly. Uh, th they've taken away uh, the um, 
you know, you having to decide between one or the other. Now, even if you got a PPP loan, you're eligible for the employee retention credit. So now obviously it's like, well, gee, thanks. Uh, you know, the year is over. Uh, how, you know, how does that going to help me? Well, it, they, they're helping you in sort of two different ways. Number one, the employee retention credit for folks who already got the PPP loan, uh, you can go back and retroactively um, apply the rules as if you had been doing it all along. So you can amend your payroll tax returns and uh, you know potentially get the benefit of the employee retention credit for 2020. Um, you know, as, as if you had not gotten a PPP loan under the CARES Act. So that's that's huge. The other thing is they're extending the ERC into 2021 um, for the first two quarters of 2021. So this will get us through June. It is it is a little confusing when you read it, and I think what where a lot of the confusion lies is they changed the rules on on how it's calculated. Um, the limitations, the limitations have gone up to where it's 10,000 per employee per quarter, as opposed to 10,000 per employee. Uh, they change the percentages into how much your business has to decline before you're eligible. Um, they change the, the, the way it used to be um, the same quarter of the prior year, but now you can maybe pick um, an immediately preceding quarter instead of picking a quarter from the prior year. So there's a lot more flexibility in the way it's calculated. I would tell you, keep this in mind. All of the changes to the calculations are only with respect to 2021. So the only thing for 2020 that the CAA did was it allows folks who didn't think they were eligible because they have a PPP loan can now go back and potentially get the benefit of it. All of the changes around the computation and which quarter and the wages and all of that that only applies to 2021. So, you know, just keep that in mind when you're reading through it. It's it's really confusing a little bit, and um, so so just kind of keep that in mind that that that's the way I try and think of it. There's sort of two separate buckets. Um, I would also say, you know, try and rely on some of the IRS guidance. It's it's generally been pretty good. Um, with the CARES Act, you could sort of go back and read it itself. Uh, the FFCRA was similar. Uh, I think the FFCRA was dozens of pages. The CARES Act was a few hundred pages. The problem with the CAA is, is it's, it's an, a lot of government legislation completely unrelated to COVID um, that was all wrapped together in one bill. It was the spending bill and all of this. CAA is about 5,600 pages of eight point font. So it's, it's a lot harder to sort of get in there and, and read through it. So uh, I would tell you definitely as it relates to this, you know, sort of stick with some of the secondary guidance. Um, just going through this again from the CARES Act, we had that first round of rebate checks. So uh, depending on your income level, um, you potentially could be phased out of this. But if you weren't, um, you could get up to, you know, $1,200 per person plus 500 for each child. Uh, it was completely phased out at about 198. And when we compare it to the second round of rebate checks, um, the child amount went up from 500 to 600, but the individual amount went down um, from 1200 to 600. Uh, and the phase outs are, are relatively the same. Um, but, um, but again, this is, this is the second round from the CAA. So very similar to those rebate checks we got from the CARES Act. Um, this was also one that I, th I think a lot of people were really happy about. Um, so again, to sort of refresh everyone's memory, um, the TCJA, which was the tax law change Trump brought in at the very end of 17, uh, it was first effective basically for tax year 18. They did away with entertainment expense. Um, so any entertainment expense was completely non-deductible. So those Astros tickets, uh, taking the client golfing, the deer lease, you can still do it if you want, but you're not going to get a tax deduction. Um, but business meals were still sort of similar to the old rules, which were 50% deductible um, if there was a you know business purpose and there's a lot of record keeping requirements. Um, but those rules were kind of similar to what it was before the, the Trump tax law. So what the CAA does here is it sort of brings back um, the, 
the um, non-deductible, but but not for entertainment, but strictly for meals. And and this was a way to sort of help our restaurant um, folks who are really really struggling right now. So here the meal business meals now are no longer 50% deductible, they're potentially 100% deductible. So you have all of the same record keeping and business purpose requirements that you had under the old rules, but you're not getting that 50% haircut on your tax return. Um, it's 100% deductible. So this is going to be for tax years 21 and 22. So it's not retroactive. So when you're doing your 20 return, we're still going to be at 50% for meals um, and zero for entertainment. But for 21 and 22, still zero for entertainment. Sorry. Uh, but at least the meals will be 100% deductible. So we haven't had that for a long time. So it'll be interesting to see uh, if uh, everybody's going out buying each other lunch. Um, CAA also made some changes to um, the cafeteria plan, sort of our flex spending plans. Um, there's a lot of changes here. Um, and again, just to kind of highlight a little bit of it, um, a lot of this, again, we're trying to make sure people have cash in their pockets, um, you know, to sort of get through this. And so, uh, you know, the, it, for those of you who are familiar with FSAs, a lot of them are use it or lose it. And so what this law does is it, it, it sort of softens those rules. Um, if, you, you know, if, 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 if you didn't get in all your expenses, you have some extra time, you can carry over some costs. Um, the, the deadlines for requesting uh, payments out of your FSAs are um, a little bit softened. So just a little bit easier to get money out of an FSA and, and, and not have it quite be so harsh with use it or lose it. Um, similarly, retirement accounts, um, you know, they're, they're making it easier to uh, get loans from your retirement accounts uh, to get money, um, distributions from your retirement accounts without paying the penalties. So we saw a lot of this in the CARES Act. Um, CAA um, is extending some of this. I think it's a, technically within the law. It's 180 days from the date the law is enacted, which uh, Mr. Trump signed it on the 27th, so that would give us through June 24th. Um, so there's just a kind of a broadening on getting a loan out of your retirement account. Um, it's a lot more taxpayer friendly in, in how it can be repaid. So again, just trying to help folks out cash wise. Um, for any teachers in the crowd or uh, folks who know teachers, um, they're allowed to deduct uh, any expenses for PP&E um, as, as eligible educator expenses. And, and that one is, uh, that's one of the ones that is retroactive. So uh, potentially this could help folks when they do their 2020 tax return uh, for our teachers out there. Um, this one probably doesn't apply to a lot of people, but just uh, make you aware. So, the medical deductions, uh, for those of you who itemize, you can get medical deductions up. Um, it's, it's after a certain percent of your AGI. Uh, and they've been playing around with this uh, threshold to get into medical deductions back and forth. And so this uh, is for uh, tax years uh, beginning in 21, uh, but they, they brought it back down to seven and a half percent. So just trying to make it a little easier for folks with, uh, with some significant medical costs. And, um, you know, it's not a good tax presentation until you have a catch all slide at the end uh, to try and make it sh like you've covered everything. Um, so again, this may not apply to a whole lot of folks, but if it does, uh, great. Uh, just wanted to make, make you aware that um, there's, you know, the, the energy efficient uh, buildings, a lot of those deductions are permanent. Um, they've increased uh, lifetime learning credits, uh, again, trying to help folks uh, with, with uh, education expenses. Um, a lot of excise taxes have been um, adjusted and, and reduced. Um, a lot of, there were some uh, tax credits that were set to extend. So this is way back, you know, it seemed like um, five or 10 years ago, we used to always have these uh, provisions that were going to sunset and then in December Congress would always extend them another year or two. So similar to that, that's kind of what happened here. We got a lot of the tax credits um, that many of them were maybe going to expire 
um, but they went ahead and extended them for a couple years. Um, and you know, mortgage insurance premiums being uh, deductible mortgage interest. So that that wraps up the tax piece. So I will hand it off for our financial statement presentation. All right, well, thanks, Jason. Um, so we've just covered the tax presentations and the credits. Now we're gonna move into another common question, which is where in the world and how in the world are we supposed to record this PPP loan on the financial statements? And so there's really two main options. It's either as debt or as a grant. And so to determine which option to follow, borrowers would need to analyze all of the facts and circumstances regarding their PPP loan, and then determine is it probable that the borrower will meet both the eligibility criteria for a PPP loan and the loan forgiveness criteria for all or substantially all of the PPP loan. And so Jonna will probably be covering the details of some of those criteria shortly. But if the borrower can support that they can meet or it's probable to meet both criteria, then they would be able to account for it as a grant, uh, which would initially be recognized as deferred income liability. But if they cannot support that it's probable that they'll meet both criteria, then they would record it as debt. And so essentially both will be recorded as some sort of liability, but the derecognition process will be different for either or. But at no point can we just not record on the financial statements. It does need to be represented on your books. And so the assessment of whether it's probable should be an ongoing one, just given the circumstances and the changes that are constantly happening uh, regarding the criteria. So uh, the borrower should monitor these developments when evaluating. So kind of breaking this down, uh, starting with debt. So when the PPP loan is accounted for as debt, you do need to accrue for the interest uh, over the term of the loan. When it comes to derecognizing the debt, uh, really you can only derecognize if you've made payments to the creditor or you have legally released the obligation by the, uh, you, you've been legally released from the obligation by the creditor. So in the case of the PPP loan forgiveness, if you've received actual notice that your loan has been forgiven, you would then derecognize the debt and any unpaid accrued interest and recognize it as a gain on debt extinguishment or uh, some, some will call it gain on debt forgiveness. And you would then record this in your other income on the income statement. Now from a, a statement of cash flow presentation standpoint, the amount borrowed and repayments made would follow your normal protocol of the inflows and outflows from financing activities. But if you do have portions of the debt forgiven, then you would classify it as a non-cash transaction. And so for any amount that were not forgiven, the borrowers are required to begin repaying at the later of 10 months following the cover period or when the SBA remits the amounts forgiven to the lender. <clears throat> now, very quickly to go through the grant process, as it relates to grants, the PPP amount would be recorded as deferred income liability, and the borrower would actually derecognize the liability over a period of time based on when the expenses are being recognized of which the grant was intended to be used for. So with grant, it's more of a systematic or rational derecognition versus with debt, it's based on when you officially receive that notice. Now with the income statement presentation, you know, it can be one of two ways, either offsetting the related expenses or you can present the income separately as other income on the, on the statement. Um, however, just Keep in mind that you should never record the forgiveness as part of your normal revenues from operations. Um, lastly, you know, now let's say that the borrower concluded that it is probable that they'll meet the criteria and they do record it as a grant. But sub subsequently to this conclusion, they actually discover that a portion of the loan will need to be repaid. Well, the financial statements would need to present this as a change in estimate. 
And so a disclosure would need to be presented in your financials to discuss the change in the expectations. And then, you know, here the last paragraph of this slide is pretty much just saying that from a statement of cash flow presentation, you can elect to either present the activity in operating activities where the related expenses are being presented, or you can elect to present it as a, a financing activity. So I know I went through that very quickly, but that's a very quick summary of the two accounting treatments and presentations. So I'll pass it over to Eric to provide the SBA update. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Krista, and thank you certainly everyone for joining us today. Um, like Kevin said, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Eric Deal. I work in the BNV Capital Advisors Group here at Briggs, and we're the investment banking uh, division of the firm. And just I wanted to share a couple quick comments um, on the overall SBA landscape and some of the, some specifics on M&A transactions. Um, so I'll walk through this here pretty quickly. But um, PPP obviously is is the most popular SBA program. And Jana will uh, provide a more detailed update in a couple minutes. So skipping over to the Economic Injury Disaster Loan or the EIDLs, this program is currently open. You may remember last year it had opened and closed several times throughout the year. Um, but as of now, the portal is open and a reminder that this is applied for directly. It does not need to go through an SBA lender um, and these loans are non-forgivable. So the terms are, fair, are favorable. Uh, but these are not forgivable uh, types of loans. You may remember the idle grant as well uh, that was extremely popular once the CARES Act opened last year. That was that paid $1,000 um, per employee up to 10,000 and it was a free grant. That is no longer available as of today. However, with the CAA, the idle grant is coming back but in a much more targeted capacity. Um, and it should be available for companies who are considered to be in low income communities, um, those with fewer than 300 employees and companies that have incurred a 30% reduction or more in gross receipts over an eight week period in 2020 compared to the same period in 2019. So there's, it's, it's in the act, I think like Jason said, it's about 5,000 pages. So there hasn't been a whole lot of um, guidance, I guess, or subsequent guidance coming out from the SBA on this specifically, but that's what we've heard so far. Just know that it will be coming back in a much in a much targeted facility. It's not going to be a broad grant like it was before. SBA bridge loans, I believe these are being extended as well. Just a reminder, these are bridge loans that are short-term loans uh, available to current SBA Express borrowers only. And they're meant to be kind of a bridge between while other loan applications are pending. The SBA relief program, the, CE, the CAA does extend the SBA debt relief program. Um, according to a press release I saw over the weekend, it's the SBA is still determining how much debt relief assistance will ultimately be provided. But this is where the SBA covers principal and interest payments for 7A, 504, and micro loans as well. So it, it could be anywhere from three to six months um, with the SBA covering those payments, but I don't believe that has been published, at least not that we've seen. So moving on to the M&A topic, um, the PPP has had an effect on nearly all of our M&A clients. So we did want to briefly touch on the SBA guidance that's currently out there um, for business owners who are contemplating a sale of their company or ones who might even already be in the process of selling their company while also participating in the PPP. So for purposes of PPP, a change in ownership will be considered to have occurred under these following circumstances, at least 20% of the common stock or other ownership interest of a PPP borrower is sold or otherwise transferred. That can be true if the threshold is met over multiple transactions and it also is inclusive of um, transactions between affiliates and existing owners. Secondly, if the borrower sells or otherwise transfers at least 50% of its assets, and that's measured by fair market value, again, that could occur in more than one transaction over the life of the PPP loan. Um, and then finally, if, the PP, if a PPP borrower is merged into or with another entity, so the question becomes, how do the parties of an M&A transaction address the PPP? This usually arises when a selling entity has received a PPP loan, 
spent the proceeds but has not completed the forgiveness process, maybe has a forgiveness application pending. So from what we've seen and the guidance that the SBA pushed out back in October, um, which we believe is still current, this guidance directs the buyer and seller to withhold an amount of the sale proceeds that's equal to the amount of the outstanding PPP loan and place those funds into an escrow account to be held by the, uh, by the lender, by the PPP lender. So after the transaction closes and then the forgiveness process is later completed, let's say the loan is 100% forgiven, then the funds from that escrow account are then released back to the seller. And if the loan is not fully forgiven, then the escrow account would be used to pay off any remaining balance that was unforgiven. And then the seller would then receive the rest of the proceeds in that escrow. So note, if a forgiveness process is completed prior to a transaction closing, then there really isn't much to do um, other than maintain accurate records um, as directed by the CPA. So it works similar to an indemnities escrow, except that this is a strictly separate escrow for PPP, um, which makes the reporting a little bit easier. In practice, this can get a little bit more complicated. For instance, private equity firms in large part are ineligible from participating in the PPP. So when a private equity firm acquires a PPP borrower with an outstanding loan, there can be some nuances with forgiveness depending on the timeline and when the loans were dispersed and with the the forgiveness, the status of the forgiveness application. So we've seen just these in all different types of, of transactions. Um, lastly, if for whatever reason, it's not possible to set up the escrow, then the SBA has outlined some specific procedures on gaining SBA approval. We won't go into those here, uh, but just know that it's out there um, in the SBA change of uh, ownership procedural notice that's on their website. So with that, I will pass it to Jenna for the grand finale on the PPP. Go ahead, Jenna. Hi, my name is Jenna Kelly, and I have the distinct pleasure of talking to you a little bit about PPP. I wanted to address one thing just to follow up on Krista because I'm seeing multiple questions come through. For clarity, when, um, when we make the comment that the PPP loan moves to income but is removed from income, what we're talking about at that point is taxable income. So uh, just keep that in mind as you walk through. So let's start with PPP headlines here. There's a lot of things that have changed recently and um, some exciting news. Current PPP borrowers are gonna get a second chance at a loan if that um, becomes a situation where the borrower feels a need. There are some um, changes to how that will work and we'll discuss those. There's some additional payroll costs and other costs that can be covered by that PPP loan and we'll discuss that as well. There's some new borrower and lender application forms. Some have been released. Some we're still waiting on, like some updated forgiveness forms. We'll discuss that. Some simplified forgiveness, uh, specifically for loans under $150,000, we're expecting a new form. But even between $150,000 and $2 million, there will be some changes on some of the documentation that needs to be provided. We don't have the details of that yet. That has not been released, but that we expect that in the coming days. Change in covered period and that type of thing. So let's go ahead and jump right in. Some of the new features. So we, we sometimes call it PPP2 or a second draw and a first draw. Your existing borrowers are gonna be eligible meeting certain requirements for a second draw of PPP funds. Uh, one thing to remember is they're generally treated and, and handled the same way PPP1 was handled, same eligibility plus a little more. Um, but the rules are the same. So I've seen a couple of questions come through about the deductibility of PPP2. Don't think of it as this, this is a completely separate program. This is just another draw of the same program. So they will continue to be deductible for tax purposes. Um, a nice change is businesses that have PPP loans now can take the employer retention tax credit, which Jason discussed earlier. Another question I've seen come through a lot on the chat is the idle advance. So many borrowers went through the forgiveness process and then noticed that the amount of forgiveness was reduced by that idle grant. Now, keep in mind, we're not talking about an idle loan here. We're talking about a grant. Typically, it was 10,000 or less. It was about 1,000 per employee. Well, that has changed. So many of my borrowers are asking, how do we get that money back? I would assume, although I don't know yet, that the SBA will remit that back to your lender and your lender will send it to you. But the details of how that's going to be moving through the system are unclear at the moment, but you should see that money come back to you. 
And then some expanded credibility, eligibility for certain um, businesses, housing co-ops, news organizations, 501c6s, and some certain marketing organizations. So let's talk a little bit more about the qualified costs. Um, some of the new guidance gives us a little deeper detail into what's considered a payroll cost. So a payroll cost can include your group life insurance, disability, vision, and dental. That was specifically outlined. That's in that 60% bucket, so to speak. But in the other 40% where you can use the money for non-payroll costs, we have a lot of new things here to discuss. Um, we have four kind of broken out here. We'll go through them fairly quickly just for the sake of time. Operation expenditures such as like software for your cloud computing, accounting software, human resources software, or systems. The second one is an interesting one. Property damage that's not covered by insurance due to rioting or looting for public disturbances that took place during 2020. The third one, supplier cost for the supply of goods where you have some kind of contract in place or purchase order prior to the um, covered period. Now, perishable goods can, of course, not be required to have that type of contract, but generally supplier costs are now in that 40%. And then lastly, and a big expense for many businesses is PPP, PPE equipment. So worker protection costs, physical alterations like the plexiglass you might see at HEB, these are all included in the 40% bucket of the non-payroll costs. So what's changing? Uh, a lot of things. Existing PPP and SBA core requirements still apply. So some of the original um, eligible and ineligible entities, that has not changed. And then there's a, some added changes here. So one of the most important ones is the 300 employee limit. So for a second draw, the uh, borrower cannot have more than 300 employees across all the locations unless it is um, one of the entities that has an NAICS code beginning with 7-2. In that case, they can have 300 per physical location. That's the restaurant industry specifically carved out. Maximum loan amount is, of course, reduced. And then now, as we all have heard by now, there's a revenue test. And we'll talk a little bit about that um, in detail later. But in general, uh, a borrower needs to be able to reflect that they had a revenue reduction of 25% or more in any quarter of 2020 as compared to the same quarter of 2019 or on an annual basis as well. And I did see a question come through related to someone who had a new business. For the PPP loans, the business needs to be in place by February 15th, 2020. In 2019, if there are any um, businesses that were not in place, there are some special rules for which quarters that you would um, can compare that that are outlined in the SBA IFER that we have a link provided in the um, appendix. So the first straw loans, let's talk about those because some people may go back and make a first straw loan. Perhaps some of the people on this call never received their first PPP loan, but would like to apply. Um, the affiliation rules still apply, 500 or fewer employees, some special rules for the NAICS codes and the newly eligible borrowers. Um, some interesting set-asides are available. So perhaps someone on the call has not taken a first draw loan and they might be in this, this bucket, so to speak. They may only have 10 employees and they're looking for a really small loan. There's some money set aside specifically for small businesses, for minority owned businesses. And so there's some interesting things going on here. Really trying to, really obvious they're trying to hit the uh, smaller borrower in this situation as opposed to a big borrower. Um, if you want to reapply, so we've had a few clients who um, did not receive their forgiveness yet, and they've looked back at their application and realized um, maybe they had returned some money because they were not sure they wanted to take it. They can go back and reapply. Or secondly, maybe there were some errors or some things that uh, changed over time. Some of the rules, as we all know, uh, everybody on this call watches this fairly closely, and the rules change sometimes in the middle of a webinar. And they are constantly changing and therefore some of the rules may have limited someone's ability to have um, a certain loan amount and now they think they should have a greater loan amount, they can now reapply. But probably most people here are interested in the second draw. So for PPP2, existing PPP borrowers that have to have used or will use the full amount of the loan in the appropriate way. Now, notice that it doesn't say it has to have reached forgiveness yet. I think that's important to note. 
You simply have to substantiate that either you've used it or will use the money. Again, 300 and fewer employees. We've talked a little bit about the um, revenue test. I noticed one thing in the uh, interim final rule that SBA issued where it referenced using a tax return. This is not required from what we understand. A tax return to uh, show that your revenue is reduced by the appropriate amount. It may be that this is really only useful for borrowers who, um, for one thing, have filed their 2020 tax return, which I doubt anyone has done yet, but who also may have difficulty carving out their quarterly revenue. And we'll talk a little bit about what does that quarterly revenue really look like. The business cannot be permanently closed for obvious reasons. And um, you know, if you go back to your previous lender, they already have all your 2019 data. So if this is your second draw and your previous lender has your 2019 calculation of your loan, that's gonna be the simplest way to apply for a PPP2 loan. They have everything there, uh, which means that you're not required to pull a bunch of documentation together or recalculate, and you should be able to just reapply for a second draw. Some of the things to think about there are um, the 2019 um, employee number is what we think the second draw will be. I, I noticed this question earlier. The second draw will, when the number of employees should be 300 employees, if you're using 2019 data, we would assume that then you would be able to substantiate that with your 2019 data. So the revenue test, let's really dig in here. The question I probably get the most is what's revenue? What's gross receipts? And, you know, uh, they're like typical tax code is written, there's a little bit of gray area here. Here's generally what we understand. And there's a little snip right here at the bottom of the screen that's actually from the form for the PPP2 application. And so you notice that it says reduction in gross receipts of at least 25%. There's some special rules for people under 150,000, but be cautious here. While an under $150,000 borrower does not have to write the number on this form, they do have to submit this by the time they reach forgiveness. So I assume this is just to expedite things, but don't be lulled into thinking that it doesn't matter. The revenue is in whatever form received. It does not include your first PPP loan. It's not revenue. The first PPP loan, as Krista explained, is definitely not revenue. So you won't include that loan in your gross revenue test. What you will want to do is think of it um, from the standpoint of your financial statements. So you may produce a financial statement that reflects that quarter two versus of 2020 versus quarter two of 2019 has a 25% or more reduction. Do you use cash or accrual? That has not been specifically stated, but uh, best practice that we hear from other professionals is to consider using the same cash basis or accrual basis that you would use to file your tax return for consistency and clarity of support. Go on to the next slide. So ineligible borrowers, this is important. Um, entities that are primarily engaged in lobbying or political, notice the word primarily, which we would assume means more than 50% of your activities are in that space. Um, and there's a lot of others here. I won't drill down into all of these. We're gonna make this available, but I do think it's important to note that this is there is one big change and it's in bullet three where it says certain entities are organized under the laws of People's Republic of China. The verbiage there is um, specific and vague all at the same time. So if you have a situation where you need to drill down into that, there may be times to actually bring an attorney in on that uh, distinction and make sure that you're in compliance. Um, you can't have received a grant under the Economic Aid to Hard Hit Small Businesses, Nonprofits and Venues Act, obviously public companies, and again, any entity that's closed or bankrupt. So simplified forgiveness, we referenced this earlier for the 150,000 or less borrowers. Basically the forgiveness is gonna look like this, although the form has not been released. The borrower is gonna sign and submit basically a certification. So keep in mind you're signing that, you need to feel very comfortable with the calculation in the background. Um, you'll submit the number of employees that you were able to retain. You'll list the total amount paid on payroll but the other uh, calculations and additional information is not expected to be required. Uh, we hope to see that new forum soon. Between 150 and 2 million, well, that's probably a lot of people on this call here. So it looks like going forward, there's gonna be no requirement to submit documentation for FTEs or payroll or payroll rates, the canceled checks. Uh, we assisted many borrowers here and sometimes the 
um, package we put together had several pages of canceled checks and therefore uh, a lot for the lender and the SBA to look through. But always retain your records. I would always suggest that a borrower take a, the time to create a cloud-based file of all the PPP support because if you were to ever receive any questions going forward, uh, it's hard to remember what happened three or four years ago. The loan necessity questionnaire, this is an important one. We, I saw a question come through here earlier about, you know, will the SBA looking at over 2 million borrowers, um, is that include affiliates? The 3509, which is the loan necessity questionnaire, is really the first step for the SBA to start taking a look at the over 2 million borrowers. It's their way of deciding, do I need to get more information or does this first look tell me everything I need to know? And you'll notice that on that uh, very top of that form, if you take a look at it, it'll say for borrowers over 2 million together with their affiliates. So the understanding that we have is that if you had a loan of 600,000 and your other business had a 700,000 and maybe your third business had an 800,000, that would put you over the limit even though each one is not uh, an over 2 million in and of itself. Those two loans have caused a lot of stress. I mean, those two questionnaires, pardon me, have caused a lot of stress. And, uh, you know, the way to answer these, and it's true that many of these are just now getting submitted and prepared, so we haven't seen a lot of how the SBA will respond, but the thing to think about here is to just tell the story, tell the story completely and truthfully and accurately as you can, uh, and give the SBA some further information. They really are just trying to receive more information. It, and I have a little quote here, a request to complete the loan necessity questionnaire does not mean the SBA is challenging your certification. That's straight from the SBA. So that's simply their way of um, short-staffed group of people in the SBA to take a look at what, you, um, what your situation is. So the current forgiveness applications, before we dive into this, I noticed a question earlier that um, was talking about reference periods, and that's a big part of the forgiveness application. So anybody that's partially or completely through this process knows that when they did their FTE calculation, they compared the number of full-time equivalent employees during their covered period and their reference period. Now, how will that work in the PPP2? Your covered period will probably be far into 2021. What will the new reference periods be or will they be the same? At the moment, we don't know, although I would suspect that the 2019 reference periods could possibly still be the same reference periods because they're really trying to see if you can retain employees, employees from pre-pandemic dates. So it would make sense that they would continue to be relevant in that situation. Um, these three forms are our current forms. So notice I don't have a form here for the under 150,000 because it hasn't been released. But what we know today is we have the full 3508 that has a Schedule A that requires you to list out separately the over $100,000 employees and the under $100,000 employees and the owners and other details here. The EZ, which if you're eligible, is really a great form to use. Um, borrowers that find, for instance, that they are either self-employed and an independent contractor, they are eligible. Maybe you had no FTE reduction and no salary or hourly wage reduction. Maybe you kept things the same. After all, you had funds to do so. Then you're eligible to use the EZ. Or if perhaps you kept the salaries the same, but for some reason you couldn't operate at the same level as before, that certainly happens as well. And those are also eligible for the EZ. There's a lot less to certify on the form or to submit. But the calculations behind the forms, behind all forms, are still the same. You're still going to want to be able to say that you use the money appropriately for your own um, documentation and support where you ever ask for further information. And then, of course, the PPP uh, forgiveness form for the under $150,000 is very short and very simple. So some quick information about timelines. Um, the new portal did open. It's got some set aside as we talked about earlier. So while portals may be open, the SBA and lenders are going to be looking at uh, applications in different groups a little more so that they can try to get money to some of the people that are um, struggling. Uh, the January 13th, which is tomorrow, we are expecting the second draw PPP loans to be um, open, those portals to be open. And then uh, the SBI guidance just says a few days later. <laughs> so we don't know what that means, but portal opens for additional lenders. There's certain 
uh, community-based financial institutions that kind of get a first crack at these. The deadline to apply, and this is important, is March 31st of 2021. So I talk with borrowers all the time that are working through their forgiveness applications, and now they're thinking of applying for PPP2, and they're, they're trying to scramble to do both. Um, since the forgiveness application is, can be filed at any point during the loan maturity, uh, it's, its due date is a little further out than March 31st, so perhaps it might be wise at, at points to consider applying for PPP2 first. And then um, there's some, you know, continued bar barriers that the SBA will be assessing to make sure that businesses that really need the funds get the funds. Krista, you want to take the next slide? All right. Thanks, uh, Jonna. Um, so I had the last two slides for the session and looking at the time, hopefully my mic doesn't get cut and the music start rolling, but I'll try to make this really quick. Um, so Jonah did a great job of going through the new features and updates. I wanted to spend a quick minute to cover special features that were carved out for the restaurant and hospitality industry and for not-for-profits. And so I've listed a couple of key areas on this slide. Uh, one being that for the hospitality industry, they can apply for 3.5 times their monthly payroll versus uh, other industries are at a 2.5 rate. Um, additionally, the Relief Act was updated to allow for the 300 employee cap to be per location for restaurants versus all locations, which was a, a big opportunity for operators who had multiple locations and were unable to qualify previously. Another one was that restaurants and lodging are not subject to the SBA affiliation rules, which covered businesses that have control or power over another. So for those types of affiliations, they were there were restrictions on access to the PPP loan. However, a waiver was given for franchisor, franchisee type relationships to allow them to qualify. And then Jonna had mentioned a couple of the new forgivable non-payroll expenses. Uh, but as it relates to restaurants, you know, yes, it does include the PPE equipment, the cleaning products, the health checks, but it also includes the cost to reconfigure the restaurant space to allow for social distancing. And that also includes your outdoor dining and outdoor seating. That reconfiguration um, all kind of falls into this uh, category. Now, moving into the not-for-profits, there also are a few specialized features added. Um, eligibility requirements still remain the same for the 501c3s. Uh, there were changes for 501c6 nonprofits who didn't qualify for the first stimulus package are now eligible for the second round of PPP. Now, some of those eligibility requirements are that they cannot employ more than 300 employees Previously, that was 150. They also, uh, they must have used or will use the full amount of the first PPP. And then the remainder of the criteria relates to lobbying. So the lobbying receipts and activities cannot exceed more than 15%. Uh, previously, it was 10%. And then also there's a cap on lobbying activity cost of a million for the recent tax year, February, 2020. So I just wanted to kind of highlight and briefly touch on these two industries uh, for any of the audience members that might be relevant to. Thank you, Krista. As we kind of wrap up here, and if you've stuck with this this long, we appreciate it. And you must you must really love this PPP stuff and, and we're happy to provide the information. As, as a firm, we do have a lot of resources uh, to kind of go through to assist you in maximizing your forgiveness amount. We are here to assist you if need be. Um, either one-off questions or to be engaged to assist you in either the application process of preparing or also in the forgiveness process as well. And beyond that, tax implications, preparation for loans, and et cetera. And this last slide here just kind of notes some of the things that are some of the, the places you can connect with us in, and some of the resources that we use is we do have a COVID-19 website. You do, the SBA website is a very good, useful tool. Industry associations, banking information, those types of things as well. But Again, we are here to assist you in whatever capacity that we can. You see the contact information there to the bottom left at the SBA assistance website or SBA assistance uh, email address. 
Additionally, if you have a contact here at, at Briggs and Basilica, please reach out to them and, and we'll work to get the right answers back to you um, and assist where we can. But again, thank you for sticking with us for the last 64 minutes. We appreciate your time and we look forward to assisting you in the future.